All right, you guys, if this is your first time seeing this printer or when you did first see this printer, if you didn't know what it was, you probably thought, what a stupid gimmick. Why would they rotate a perfectly good Core XY printer, uh, you know, 45 degrees about the X axis? Is it just to save some money on a couple of uprights? You know, this is just a gimmick to get you to buy more printers, right? That's not true. It's actually really functional. It's really cool. By rotating it at 45 degrees like that, you can print, they're calling it an infinite Z. So you can print parts which are much larger than the envelope of the printer. So this is a two foot long bed. I can easily print a 10 foot long part here in this room. Um, that's what these rollers are for. They're gonna bolt there to the front of the printer here. We'll get to that. We're gonna do that here later in the video. Um, but oh, speaking of what we're gonna get to, check out this footage. This is the, uh, the live unboxing footage. You could watch that video if you want to see me sort of first impressions of this printer, two and a half hour long video. Um, but we're gonna pick up in this video right where I left off. With this print, this was the print that I started in that stream and uh, we're gonna pop this off. Then I'm going to learn how to slice because it's, uh, it's a thing. We've got an, a post processor that we have to use to cant those, those prints at 45 degrees. And yeah, so we're gonna do that and then I'm gonna go over the surface. There's just some obvious things right here on the surface to critique. And then I'm going to take it apart and we're going to look at this belt assembly and see if there's, well, see if that is even viable because maybe it's not, you guys. I don't know. This is, this is brand new stuff here, um, trying to merge manufacturability with functionality. And it's, it's not, especially with uh, trying to come in at a bargain price. So we don't know what the price is going to be on this machine. I can't even start to comment on that. Um, people in my live stream chat were guessing $500 to $1,000, but I have no idea, honestly, you guys. So, yeah, my job is to criticize this thing and to try to, uh, you know, call out its faults so that they can be addressed and it can be better. So let's get to it. All right, so here is the um, completed Benji. Now it's obviously an oversized Benchy. This is what we started to print in the live stream. It took, I think, around 15 hours for this print to finish. And that, I mean, I have no idea why. I did not slice this. Uh, this is a Core XY machine, so it should be able to print uh, more quickly than that. Um, different than a normal Core XY machine, we are fighting gravity. So it's kind of got a Z component to one of the directions. So, um, yeah, that's gonna have ramifications on the speed at which this printer can go. So um, there's lots of, you know, lots of things have changed, but um, you can take a look at this Benchy. We'll, we'll get a closer look here in a second, but what I wanna try right now on camera is to see just how difficult this is to remove. So by the way, this is a nylon bed. You see the, uh, the fabric? So it's ni nylon that has been bonded to a, uh, a urethane, a polyurethane. And Naomi tells me that um, this zigzag belt is only one of the types. There's another type that has like a diagonal cut and there's another type that has just a flat cut. And these are being, very interestingly, they're being repurposed from uh, manufacturing. So these are like treadmill uh, or, or like, um, yeah, like call them treadmill, but they're, f they're for like, you know, think of Amazon's warehouses with all the belts of, ev of everything that go everywhere. That's, that's what this is. So, um, I don't really like this idea. So I, I said in the live stream that there's there's that there's no seam on this um, on this belt, but that is actually the seam. So that's where the belt gets cut in that in that crazy pattern. But I can't. I mean, I've tried. I've really tried, taking my thumbnail to it to some extreme extent, and I can't get that belt to break loose. It might be different um, under the heat, like under the heated bed, but I don't think that there's ever going to be any forces trying to peel that off the polyurethane. Um, right there at the heated at the heated bed portion. So, um, yeah, let's see if it. Look, at I printed right over the um, right over the seam. So let's see if we when we peel this off, if it takes the belt with it. Okay. Well, that does not want to come off like this. Maybe if I push right here in this corner as I'm lifting. Well, I can get it started. I feel it started. It's got a. There's a thing in there. I could shove my knife under there and pry it up uh, to get this off, but let's do this the more elegant way, shall we? Let's go um, motion, move axis, 
Move Z. We're going to move it 10 millimeters. We're going to just start going to town here. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but it can hear it peeling off. <laughs> How cool is that? Okay, let's take a look at it. Got some exaggerated lighting going on here to really accentuate the flaws. We can see down here in the beginning of the print, the belt uh, was doing some run-in. So basically it was, um, yeah, it was trying to just center itself so that it, you know, and it did. It looks like by, by about the time we got to there, the belt was mostly stable. We do see some sort of layer shifting. Not terrible, but not great. Um, I wouldn't call that a layer shift. That's just the, that's clearly just a little bit of warble in the belt. But by the time we got to this print here, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a bit of a shift right there. I don't, I don't know if I'd call that layer shift though. I mean, it's clearly a belt artifact. It's coming from this belt moving side to side. So it is, it is, uh, it is not good. I mean, it could be a lot better, but um, all in all, not a bad print. Looks like um, we got to work on retraction settings maybe. This filament should have been bone dry coming from, uh, you know, it was straight out of the package. So I can't imagine the filament was wet to be blamed here. So we got just some, some slicer retraction settings to worry about in there. But all this cleans up if I just, uh, yeah, it's all small. It just sort of chips off. So this, uh, this print will clean up pretty nicely. Um, so yeah, aside from the layer shifting, it looks pretty good. I mean, this is an oversized Benji, so we can't really, can't really t tell too much. Um, well, I don't like that. Is that a... Okay, well, we got good bridging up here, right? Yeah, the bridging looks... Well, it's not even that great. Um, I don't know. I've never printed a Benchy this size before. I think I might be able to, and I emphasize might, be able to improve the part cooling. Um, we'll see. I'll, I'll certainly give it a go. Overall, um, a decent Benchy. Decent. Not great. Um, and the weirdest thing about this is that it was printed in this orientation like this, so that it was uh, planar to the um, to the Corex Y gantry, or uh, I don't know what to call that, the, the whole apparatus, the whole Corex Y apparatus. So this allows us to compare apples to apples as far as uh, normal benchies are concerned. Um, I just wish it was scaled to be the same size as a normal benchy, so that I could, uh, you know, show you guys how that how that compares to all the other benchies out there. A uh, couple of other interesting things to talk about on this te test print. Uh, the underside here, we can see where the, um, you know, the, it registered on the print where the where the seam on the belt was. And then there's a real distinct texture to this um, underside. You can definitely feel the fabric uh, coming through. And those dark patches, I think, will go away. Those are not holes in the print. Those are, I don't know, pieces of the, the belt from in between or something. Little pieces of dirt. Or, I don't know, but I think that's going to... That's going to go away with time, those those dark uh, black... I might be able to wash those off even. Anyway, um, this is cool. You see you see under here, you see the seam where the boat meets the uh, the, the support material or the, the triangle there? There's no gap. There's nothing missing. But on the other side, there is a gap. And if we think about that, as it was printing in this orientation, that was kind of printing into nowhere right there. So there's going to be... It's an interesting gap. You're gonna to have to have some sort of like internal support material, more so than the uh, than the than the infill. At moments like that, where we have an internal crease, it's just an interesting thing to think about. And yeah, that does not break off. I've tried to break it off, so it is quite quite firmly uh, established. But you guys want to know what the absolute most thrilling, just the coolest thing about this test print is, and this is phenomenally interesting. You guys, I printed. 90 degrees, or almost 90 degrees, almost parallel with the bed. You see that? Talk about an overhang. That, okay, so call that a 75 degree overhang. Up here, yeah, that's there's gotta be a 90 degree overhang right there. So, because the nozzle is pushing the filament down that direction, we don't have normal overhanging issues. You guys, you know what this means? Do you guys know what this means? This is so exciting. This means five axis 3D printing is the future. It's so important to be able to print with your nozzle in other orientations other than the uh, the normal, you know, 
3D, 2.5D printing that we're used to with a static nozzle that doesn't move. Well, you can see that in preparation for this long part that I'm about to print, I installed the rollers here off the front of this machine. And this looks, wow, it looks just super professional and I, I love the way it looks. But there's a couple of problems. First of all, these, um, I don't know what you call them, little decorative pieces were sitting down inside of there. So I had to peel these out and they did not include those up here. So I think they were, these were meant to go here and the ones back here were meant to be empty so that you could screw this in. So a little mistake from the factory there, but I gotta say as cool as this looks and as professional and as beefy and awesome as this looks, I completely disagree with this whole roller assembly. It's total, utter bumpkiss. First of all, putting my rusty framing square here on it, we can see that this collides with the bed. You see, watch it lift up there. See, so there's about a two millimeter gap down below. Okay, so 3D printed parts are pretty lightweight and they're not that flexible under their own weight. So that part is gonna be able to cantilever out probably till here or maybe here. You know, so we're getting two or three rollers use at best from that 3D printed part coming out here. Um, so it's gonna cantilever itself out to here. So why do we have rollers so close? So. You know these rollers aren't cheap. I had to pay, well I didn't have to pay, but you're gonna have to pay for these rollers that are just completely useless. They just, nothing ever ever touches these first couple of rollers. Second of all, these rollers are not perfect. Like see this one? I can spin this one. Some of them just spin, like this one, right? It just spins, it doesn't touch. And you can see the gap there that just spins. So that 3D printed part will never touch this one. And if it does touch this one, it's gonna get bent back up to touch this one because they're not perfectly uh, aligned height-wise. Now, these rollers come from industry where they've got weight pressed on them and that weight deflects them so that they all are doing their job. But it's completely the wrong solution for catching lightweight 3D printed parts. This is BS and absolutely has no business being on this printer. Moving on, the customer is gonna have to pay for four of these stupid rollers. And that is just absolutely the wrong technique. Now, you can be all spinal tap about it and go, well, it's four, so it's one more, and, and that's always better. If you can see, yeah. the numbers all go to 11. Look, right across the board. Oh, 11, oh, 11, most 11, and now it's got up to 10. Exactly. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? It's not 10. You see, most, most blokes are gonna be playing at 10. You're on 10 here, all the way up, all the way up, yeah. all the way up. You're on 10 on your guitar, where can you go from there? Where? I don't Nowhere, know. exactly. What we do is if we need that extra push over the cliff, you know what we do? Put it up to 11, one. exactly. One louder. Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These guys are 11. It's not always better. Okay, so. Think about this, we have, um, let's use this carriage right here. Right? We have these belts right here and right there that are attaching asymmetrically off the side of the four rollers. So if the forces coming through the machine are pulling hard on this belt right here, what we're introducing is a racking force where this whole mechanism here is trying to pivot like that, okay? So when it tries to pivot like that, it's gonna put pressure on this wheel and this wheel down here, okay? And these two wheels are just gonna be floating in the air. And in fact, right now, I can reach down and spin this wheel with my hand. There's no pressure on it whatsoever. Okay, if I rack this, now I can't spin that wheel. So we have two wheels at any given time that are doing nothing, except that third wheel, one of those two wheels kind of uh, keeps the trailing edge of this um, carriage from twisting along the axis. So there's an axis from the, 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 um, the, the not the pivot point, what, what should I call it, the friction point, the, 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 the contact patch of this wheel and this wheel, that's a two dimension, that's two points which can pivot. So you can pivot about those two points. So one of these two wheels here is the guiding sort of, think of it like a rudder on a boat that keeps this going straight. So that's the only purpose of these two wheels once they're um, offload, you know, once they're unweighted because of the, the, where the forces are going. So four wheels, the only reason you could ever possibly need four wheels is if you need more strength but the forces going through a 3D printer are not that great. You never, this is all overbuilt to begin with. You're never gonna need four wheels. So that gives us two adjustments that we need to, to play with, which is stupid. Like having, making twice the work just to get this pulley adjusted and we have extra weight and we all know that inertial mass is the number one problem in 3D printing for, um, for causing ghosting and rippling, and also layer shifting if you start to print at high speeds. So inertial mass is the layer of quick printing, especially on a printer printed at 45 degrees here, 
where you're having to lift the weight up into the air every time you make a, what is that, like an, a y-axis move? You gotta fight gravity. So to have all this extra weight is just stupid, stupid, stupid. Four pulleys. I never want to see this on another printer again. This is the worst, this is the worst idea, okay? In practice, maybe it's not that tragic, but, but just from a theoretical standpoint, it's totally, totally stupid. And look, go, go back and look at all the promotional material for the, um, what was this, the, the tool changer by E3D, okay? See, they've got one, two, three pivot points or three uh, you have contact patches, because three is the right way to do it. You only need three. It's like a three-legged stool. A three-legged stool, if you look at it like this, it can't possibly wobble, because it's got three legs. But you put that fourth leg down, right? Now my thumb is the, third, the fourth leg. It can wobble back and forth between those. See that? So three-legged stools, three-legged contact patches, and three pulleys is the way to go. That's, ugh, ugh. Okay, what else? This motor right here. That shaft is, that stick out is stupid, okay? The rule for, um, uh, for this is called a uh, cantilever. And the rule for cantilevers is two thirds, one thirds. So this counts as the two thirds. So you only want to be half that distance basically. So the, so the center line on the belt here should basically be about there. That's where the center line should be, okay? Look at how, how much farther it is, it's twice out there. So again, the forces going through a 3D printer aren't that great, but I guarantee what I'm doing right now, if I had a, um, an indicator, a dial indicator on that, just me pulling on the belts is gonna be flexing that shaft and putting a lot of pressure on the bearing here at the front and the bearing at the back. So this motor, this whole mounting apparatus needs to be moved upwards inside, inset into the frame here, so that the, the, the pulley here can be lowered down. And uh, that would be, it's absolutely something that they could accomplish there at Creality. They could redesign this, this. But they're not going to because doing it like this means it's largely similar to this one. And this one's correct because the, the pulley is, this, this pulley belt system has to be, the other one is down below here. So this is the upper one. Well, over here, this is all right. This is fine. And so they're gonna use, they wanna use the same part from side to side to save some money on manufacturing. So they're not gonna be changing that. So, all right, one, two, three big issues that I've got before I even start to take apart this machine. And you know what? I've been thinking about it and yeah, I still disagree with the, um, with the part cooling duct. We'll get more into that later on. So apologies to anybody who came up with these designs um, I don't know you, <laughs> uh, I, I don't have a, you know, some sort of like a, a, a need to um, not hurt your feelings, so I'm just calling it like I see it. I don't know, I'm agnostic as far as who designed it. I don't know, but these are just stupid facets, and I don't know the design process or who had to battle and what had to happen where or whatever, but listen, I'm just an outsider who had nothing to do with the design of this printer. This is a bad idea. Four instead of three is a bad idea. And these stupid things are too heavy and they don't work. They, the, the part is not even gonna touch them till out here and then it's only gonna touch like one, maybe two of the rollers when it gets out here because they're all, they're all misaligned. So yeah, there's three things that are just like home run, just absolutely shouldn't be on this machine uh, problems that I have. All right, so those are some negative things, but let me tell you guys two positive things. So this is the best cable management that I've ever seen on a Creality 3D printer massive props and I know I didn't give them credit. In fact, I said exactly the opposite in the live stream. I said that the cable management was typical Creality uh, mess, it was spaghetti mess. But look at this, we've got these clips here that, uh, that zip tie the cables up and when this is actually attached to the, um, you know, actually we can put that in there, we don't need it to be out. So when that's attached like so, um, this is even a very clean bit of, of cabling. So nothing's going to collide with the um, with the roll, with the roll of filament. It just, it can spin freely. So very, very good uh, attention to detail there from Creality. And another thing I wanna give them massive credit for is this, um, the, the extruder me mechanism. So I heard a rumor, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard that these uh, gears are manufactured by Bontech themselves in Sweden, Switzerland, Sweden, I think. Um, yeah, so, it shows. I can see the little attention to detail here, like the uh, the bevel on this gear here, much cleaner than the clones that I was using previously. So that's that's nice to see these two things here. But everything that I said uh, critical about that that clone in my last video, 
about a better design for this, they've implemented it. See, we've got these brass, and I'm gonna guess that those are oil impregnated brass bushing um, washers. So those are not typical washers. They're sintered with oil in them so that they, they self-lubricate basically. And then you've got a shoulder bolt holding it all together. You see that? That's a shoulder bolt where the threads are only at the very tip and up the middle, the shaft is smooth. And so the rollers inside there are able to roll on a nice smooth surface. They're not trying to engage with threads because you don't want rollers rolling on threads. It greatly limits your contact patch and things just wear out as I showed. You know, in, my, in, in, in the clone version that I had, it, it wore out. It wore out the threads, it was really bad. And the final thing here is I can tighten this down. I mean, I don't wanna strip out the threads here, but that's, that's reasonably tight and it's not pinching. This still rolls. So that's, that's the way to do it. What a great, what a great job, Creality. I mean, it's still not, um, I still wouldn't call this as good as the Bontech, for sure, not as good as the Bontech, if for no other reason than because the Bontech has a three to one gear ratio and everybody seems to love uh, those, those gear ratios. You don't get any skipping, although if you're getting, um, you know, stepper motor skipping in your extruder, there's probably a reason for that and you should go back to your slicer, but still, with three to one, you can brute force the, uh, the stepper through. Anyway, um, one tell, and of course this is easy to change and the, the clone people will probably change it soon, but one tell for the genuine Creality version is seems to be this um, blue, I mean that's aluminum as well. So if this was pivoting constantly, you're gonna get galling from the aluminum to the aluminum, but we just don't pivot it that often. But still anyway, that, that bushing in there being blue instead of red seems to be kind of a a hint that you might be buying a genuine Creality. Although, I don't know if Creality sells this part. So, um, I don't know, hopefully, hopefully the clones stop being such trash because that was just, that was just a pile of garbage uh, that I reviewed. But this one, this one's all right. So, good for Creality on this design and on the cable management. So there's two things they really did well on this printer. Also, this separation between the uh, filament runout sensor and the extruder allows you to get in there with your fingers and manipulate the um, the filament, which is nice. Uh, so even though this is rigidly mounted, uh, I still find it to be a better design than a lot of the other printers coming from China. So there's three things that, that Creality did pretty well. I was just editing this video and I realized that it's kind of getting long. And if I keep going this way, uh, this is gonna be another one of my hour long videos. And those are actually pretty bad for the channel. I need to release more videos more often that are short, like just eight minute videos will, will do the trick. Uh, it's just kind of hard to cover, uh, you know, the subject of 3D printing in eight minute bites. Um, but that's, that's probably the best thing to do. Anyway, uh, yeah, we're gonna cut this video short, so that's the end of it for now. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, tune in next time for, for more goodness on the belt printer. Thanks for watching, bye.